Lord, we come into your presence. Actually, Lord, we receive your invitation to become aware of your presence with us inside of us in our inner sanctuary where you abide, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a sweet communion of love. Lord, help us to draw near to that sanctuary in times of communion with you. Lord, help us to experience as our communities come together like all these blocks form the architecture of this beautiful building. Much nicer than just a pile of blocks on a pallet. And so, Lord, you are forming all of us into a beautiful temple. As we bring our own communion of your inner presence with us together, and you are forming a new temple come down from heaven, the new Jerusalem, And we get the foretaste of that now, Father. We thank you. So, Lord, help us to lean into it with courage. Lean into it with boldness. Lean into it with wisdom. Lean into it with your presence, your communion with us, your presence among us. In a way, how you're present among us, it's richer in different ways and dimensions than our communion with you alone. And this is your desire for all creation, Lord. We, the first fruits, your church. And for that to expand outward into the world and from the world into all creations, as in Romans, all creation groans with an earnest expectation for the revealing of the sons of God, the children of God. This is what it was created for, to be this temple. That our Father who art in heaven, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, the great story of heaven and earth becoming one. So, Lord, I surrender to you the sermon I've prepared. This is my security this morning to do well, to not get lost, to not stumble. Um, I offer that to you. I'm just going to go with the short outline. So, Lord, help me. I want to connect with you and stay in this place of worship this morning, stay in this place of community with one another. We are doing the discovery event this weekend and we're taking a journey together. We're taking a journey and looking at our spiritual history. Where have we been in life? And we go back and look and we look at those places where we have highlights and we mark those with yellow post-it notes and we had red post-it notes, those places of wounding, those places of feeling abandoned or betrayed. And we put them in a timeline, we put them in chapters, and then we look at, oh, what, what are those major chapter headings of my life? And for me, it was that early life, that, my family that gave me that foundation. I've been in church since before I can remember. I was, grew up Catholic, you're in church every Sunday. Um, whether you wanted to or not, we were on vacation. We had eight kids, I was the third of eight. And we had us all lined up there every Sunday. We didn't have Sunday school. We just were there learning to sit quiet, trying not to embarrass mom and dad and God. Um, my, one, of my, one of my first memories of church was at the very end, the, the priest would say, the mass has ended, go in peace. And he would give the benediction to love and serve the Lord with gladness and faithfulness of heart or something like that. I knew that part. I knew mass was almost over because it was summertime The fans were blowing the hot air around. And he said, the mass has ended. And I shouted out, thanks be to God. (laughs) And I was mortified. (laughs) Of course, everyone laughed, but that sense of not wanting wanting to embarrass God was very strong in me. And it it created a shyness. It created a shyness in me. I'm actually very, I'm very introverted. I'm a shy, I get I get energized when I'm talking about things I like to talk about. So I'll stay up all night talking in community. It was our Mago Christi community, which Kathy and I are ministering with. We gather three times a year. Uh, We're a dispersed community. I've been connecting with them since 2010, and in 2016, Kathy and I both retired early to serve with them full-time. Kathy's still with them full-time. I'm half-time here, half-time with the Mago Christi. We're a group of spiritual formation missionaries that we, this is the space we want to abide in, is creating community. 
and that's the sermon's going to come out of that teaching this morning, is on spiritual community. But as deep as we go together as a community, because we're dispersed, we need layers of community. So I have, I have my Imago Christi friends I can go really deep with, and it satisfies those places in my soul that I need people to go to those deep, talk about those deep things of God, to really unpack them, to stay up into the wee hours of the morning and go with them. And I have my community here with the pastoral staff, and we just have, we just, it's just a beautiful place of support and freedom and release to be able to stop censoring my very best thoughts about God and lean into them. And I have this, this larger community of our, of our small group and our sacred space, uh, of our picnic on the patio, where, where we get to know one another through light touches. And when I was going through um, a divorce recovery workshop, it says you, you've had at your center of your life this one person that you've built your community around. And whether through divorce or death, when that person is gone, you're lost. I mean, your, your whole life has formed to be compatible with that person. And it's, it's tragic. And, and what we need then, um, and he talked about the pattern of Jesus, and so this morning is going to be about the pattern of Jesus. Because Jesus had, he had the inner communion of Peter, James, and John. And then he had the 12. And then you have the other disciples. And then you have the, the people who followed them. And then you have people who came and listened to their, their message. And then further out in these concentric circles, you have this, the circle of people who just wanted to be touched and healed. And further out, you had people like Nicodemus who were drawn but were afraid to commit. And then further out, you had people who heard it and, and they were against it. You, know, you had these Pharisees who were always trying to trip them up. Um, one method of evangelism is saying, who are those people in those outer concentric circles? And how do I invite them just to the next layer in, just to the next layer. So how do those people who are against the gospel, how do I invite them to just be curious? And those people who are curious, how do I invite them in to experience some light touches of fellowship, the, the picnic on the patio? And the, the people who, who are there just getting to know one another, it's like, yeah, can I trust these people with my story? Are they gonna make space for me to be seen? Or am I just a prelude for the me monster? Um, the me monster is, you tell me your story, and it's like, oh, yes, you. Well, now me, that, let, let your story, let me hijack your story, and now tell you my story, how my story is a little bit bigger and a little bit better than your story. And in our culture, we've picked that up, that, that me monster, the Mises, that your story is just a prelude to my story, you know, you, me. And uh, the Mises takes over, and so much we bring that into our families, we bring that into our communities. Uh, we oftentimes bring that into small group and then they become very toxic. We bring that into our prayer life of this communion with God. And it's like, okay, Lord, yes, Jesus, I know of spirit. I, and right now you're, you're there just drawing me into the worship of the Father. But I really want is this to be about me and, and, and my needs. And, and Lord, you have all this almighty power, but I'm not sure you really know what to do with it. I'm not really sure you're paying attention. So I'm going to give you some details in my prayer, and uh, Lord, I want you to take notes uh, because there's a way things need to be done, and I want to make, keep you on task. Um, and we get bored with that communion, and I think God gets bored with that communion, and then so I stop showing up, right? I'll just I'll bring my list and sort of drop it off and then go on about my day. And that, that sort of sucks my soul dry. And when we do that in community, it sucks the life out of community. Because we've been entrusted where Jesus says, where two or more are gathered in my name, there am I in their midst. And we have within community this, this presence of Christ among us. And it, that presence is, is the very gift that the world longs for. And I've been blessed in my life with layers of community. Uh, starting with the faith of my family, my mom, dad. It was genuine. It didn't look like the faith I kept as I grew up, but it was the same Jesus at its center. I mean, some of those forms of prayer, whew, nails on a chalkboard, you know, just take me to the dentist instead. Uh, um, yeah, wasn't the, 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 the rosary just never really nurtured my soul, but the worship at church did. The singing with songs of Jesus did. The charismatic times of prayer, of learning to pray in tongues, of learning to sit in silence together and just experience that sweet presence. These, these were the things that gave me life. Uh, 
in high school as I was my senior year, as I'm looking like, well, what's next? My, my whole life has been this vanity of vanity and chasing after medals and accolades. And I was going off to college and wanting to go into the real world. Lord, I want a life that matters. I want a life that matters for you. And um, the girl I thought was my high school sweetheart, she, you know, right after graduation, we finally got together my senior year. She was like, this was the culmination. My life was finally, and then she dumped me. She dumped me. And I was, I was driving to a prayer meeting because uh, I just started attending that Catholic charismatic prayer meeting that year. And I was just weeping so hard I had to pull over. I think it might have been coming home. I don't remember. And then I just, and the Holy Spirit just descended upon me. And those, those tears of sobbing just turned to just these sweet tears of presence. And I was like on this spiritual high for 12 weeks. Well, where, where did I get introduced to that? I got introduced to that in that community, in that prayer meeting. It wasn't any one thing any super saint did. It was just showing up and being and experiencing the presence of Christ among us. That changed my personal communion of how I experienced Christ alone. And then I bring that back into prayer community. And my whole life has been this series of personal communion and in this, commun- in this communion of Christ among us. And that's the, ri- that's the pattern of Jesus. Uh, Sasha, go ahead and put up that circle. If, uh, actually, put up the Luke passage. And that I do have written down. So, in the Gospel of Luke, we see the pattern of Jesus emerging, this pattern of communion, of community, and ministry. And oftentimes, um, I say, it, patterns in Scripture are sort of like, you don't see them until someone points them out sometimes. It's sort of like when you buy a car, or, it's like now suddenly you start seeing that car all over the place, and it's like I didn't, hardly knew it existed before then. I had a, a Subaru Outback, and I bought one, and it's like all of a sudden I started seeing them all over the place. It was 10 years ago, or 12 years ago. Maybe time for a refresh. Or not. Uh, in these, Luke uh, 6 to 12, uh, 12 through 16, and actually 6, 12 to 19. In these days, he, that's Jesus, went out to the mountain to pray. And all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them 12, whom he named apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew his brother, and James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem, in the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out and healed them all. We see in this pattern of Jesus, he goes from communion with the Father to be refreshed all night on the mountain. And then he comes down to a level place where he can gather his intimate community of his disciples around him. And together out of that community, ministry flows. Um, In our community of Imago Christi with spiritual formation, we talk about first order and second order calling. And our first order calling comes out of Jesus saying, you shall love the Lord your God with all your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. Because that's who God is is this community of love. This is the very nature of the Father's love for the Son, the Son's love for the Father, that shared love, the Spirit of God, moving out into all creation, expanding the people who can share in that love and drawing us in, drawing us in into ever more intimate circles, into that very center of communion. This is the nature of Jesus. This is the pattern in which he lived his life. And I don't, think it, I don't think it was just a random pattern. He did it because this is who he is. This is his very nature. So of course, being, am I still good or still good? He's going to live out of the being of who he is. 
His doing proceeds out of his being. Our doing, if we would be wise to pattern after Jesus, would be to abide in communion and then let our doing proceed out of that being. Community is the fruit of our communion. I'm borrowing shamelessly for this part of the talk from Henry Nouwen um, in an address he gave, I think it's Irwin College back in the 90s, at a graduation of young people about to go off and set the world on fire for God. that Jesus' pattern of that communion has to be the center. It's become what we call part of the spiritual DNA of Imago Christi, our first order calling to abide in the love of God. Out of that community forms, out of that ministry forms, when we get that flow backwards, that I want to be effective in ministry, now I better go spend some time in communion with God. When we reverse that flow, um, we're, we're always running in depletion. I give, I run dry, and then, I, and then I come back to the table, communion to fill up. And then I'm gonna give and give and give. And, and what the Lord wants us to prepare you is, a, is to be a reservoir of communion, of abiding in the Father's love. A reservoir fills up and then overflows out of its abundance, out of this spiritual abundance, out of the spiritual at-homeness with the Father, out of this sense of you are my beloved son, you are my beloved daughter, and you I am well pleased. We all have needs for connection, to be seen, to be cherished, space um, to be wept and celebrate, for security, um, for, for a sense of enablement and agency. And all this is found in the Father. And when we have that place in the Father, then we can extend and invite others into it. Because now I'm no longer relying on Bill to, um, to, to affirm my belovedness. I receive that from the Father. And I can create space for him. Um, those touches, of if a picture's worth a thousand words, then I would say a touch, is, a touch of God is worth 10,000 pictures. <laughs> And it's in spiritual community where we receive those touches of God. Uh, one of the first times I received that touch, actually, I uh, was at a, at a camp. And we had the kids down front at the altar. They were praying at an altar call. And as camp counselors, I said, just go, just go put your hand, you know, like on the back of their shoulder and just pray over them. And it was, it was Assembly of God Church. It was kids from all over. I didn't know. I, did, I was new to the church, and I certainly didn't know anyone from any of the other churches. There was one young lady in front of me. I just went and put my hand on her shoulder, was going to start praying in tongues or whatever. I don't know. Um, and as I touched her, I just felt the Lord's love for her broke my heart open with his compassion for her. I didn't know her. I don't know her story. I don't even ever think I saw her face because I didn't pull her away from her communion with God. But there was a touch there that happened. That changed my life. I have no idea what it did to her. But I, I was hooked on that experiencing Christ among us for life at 20 years of age. That, that is changed everything since then sometimes you don't know in that spiritual community is just going to arise out of the presence of christ among us but we make space for that uh, i've shared before in the in in my first marriage is that was just i mean really it was five years of daily rejection and early on in that there was one lady at church who was friends with my wife not Kathy, my first, but my first wife. I, from the choir, um, and I was just walking across the campus. She says, hi, John, how are you doing? I said, I'm fine. And she just stopped. And she looked me in the eyes, and she said, no, really, how are you doing? <laughs> she didn't offer any advice to fix anything. I don't, I, don't, I don't think she said anything after that. We just stood there. I teared up. She teared up. She says, we're, we're, we're praying for you. 
And just that act of being seen, it touched me. It touched me with the presence of Christ among us. I don't know if we ever had a conversation together before. She didn't know, she knew of me, she didn't know me that well, but she let go of, do I, do I breach this awkwardness? Do I, do I allow you to be seen? Am I gonna try to take your pain away? She didn't try to take my pain away. That's what sympathy does. Sympathy tries to take someone's pain away because it makes us uncomfortable. Empathy meets us there. And in that empathy, we receive the touch of God through that person. And I needed that touch because I had, I had a really, I had a long journey ahead of me of suffering. Um, I had another friend, David, who would meet me weekly for lunch. They didn't get touched as deeply, but we touched regularly because he knew I needed that. I just, I needed connection with somebody. They had long-term touches with our, with our life group. I, I miss our life group from our previous church. It was the person who uh, actually who led it ended up dying of ALS and then we took over. <laughs> um, but he, he and I got sick about the same time. Um, me with cancer, I got better. His ALS, it, it went progressively worse. And he was somebody I had always wanted to make friends with, but I was too shy. I was just like, well, he's, he's the head of the elder board. He's, he's a, a principal of a school, high school. And I just didn't feel comfortable intruding to invite myself into his life. That's what it felt like an intrusion. But as he got sick, I started sitting with him and walked through contemplative prayer to how to go to those places of communion at night when the drugs have you all jacked up and you can't sleep and you start spinning out and worrying about what's going to happen to my wife, what's going to happen to my family. I'm just going into those places of breath prayer. And we would sit together. And it's nothing I could fix. And I found myself as I was interceding for him. If, as I spoke out in words, my faith got less and less and less. I started begging God. I started pleading. And it just became this desperation. And my communion with God was being broken. And then uh, it was just, I think it was some book I had read from Jed, Brad Jersak, but just talked about, well, no, just... Uh, visually hold them in prayer. So I would just picture, sometimes picture the presence of God like a, like, like a, a, a natural hot spring, and I'm just, I'm just holding, him, holding my friend aloft, floating in the spring, effortlessly floating. Sometimes it was like just a, a, a waterfall pouring down upon him the glory of God and just hold him in that. Well, he died. He didn't get better, but his soul prospered. And we actually used his message that he gave just like two weeks before he died, looking like he came out of a concentration camp. His body was just from being a very strong man to being withered away. But the glow on his spirit saying, it is, I am perfectly safe. I am perfectly safe. Even in this disease, my soul is at rest in communion with the Father. And to, to be just that privilege of being one through whom God can give his touch through, um, it, is a, it is a glorious and beautiful thing in spiritual community, whether it's long-term or short-term, whether it just arises for a moment out of our larger community, we have those intimate touches of God, giving and receiving. So the pattern of Jesus, uh, concentric circles, please, Sasha. Um, the pattern of Jesus is one of communion, community, and ministry. That at that center is our communion with the Father. Before Jesus formed community, he was led out by the Spirit into the desert to test, where are you going to get your, your inner needs filled? Your sense of power, of, a, of being received, uh, your sense of security for food, your sense of affection. Where, where is that going to rest in you, son? Where, where are you going to learn just to abide in the belovedness of being the son and child of God. And Jesus is taken out into the desert, and three times he rejects uh, Satan's offer for how that, what that program to create your own coping and your own security is going to look like. And then, and then Jesus is ready to form community because he's always going about doing what he sees the Father doing, hearing what he 
and speaking what the Father is saying. In fact, the disciples, they gathered around Jesus and they, they wanted his communion with the Father. In that, you're right, we see that in the Gospels. Jesus, show us the Father. That's, that's enough. And Jesus says, have I been with you so long and you don't know me? That in that very spiritual community that is centered on Jesus' communion with the Father and his presence with us, so too the Father is, is with us. And through the Holy Spirit, we're drawn, in, drawn into the Trinitarian communion. If, we don't, if we're not grounded in community or in communion, when we come to community, now, now I'm trying to wrestle with you to fill my need for security, to fill my need for affirmation, to fill my need for attention. And I'm no longer creating a, a sacred space for Christ among us, for, for me to see you, Karen, uh, to see Kathy, to see Scott, to see Bao. We create space. We can nurture their presence and their stories as a sacred gift from God. And sometimes it's a very casual thing, but it's, it's always moving into these inner cir circles of casual acquaintance into cl closer acquaintances, into friendships, from friendships into, into spiritual friendships and spiritual friendships into these deeper communities. I say sometimes it happens in an instant. I had one stranger like today, we turn around and greeted our neighbors. I was in church, this is about uh, this 2003, I had been divorced just a couple of weeks, I think, maybe a couple of months. I was still in this, I didn't know what was happening. I, it, it was inconceivable that God would have allowed that to happen to me. It did not, did not square. My trust with God had been broken. Because I, I, you're going you're gonna to save and fix my marriage, and he didn't do it. And so I'm just sort of shell-shocked. And we're doing the meet and greet. How you doing? Yeah, my name's John. We'd never met before. And I shared this in a previous sermon. He, just, he was shaking my hand, and he says, oh my God, you're really hurting. And he just pulled me in and gave me a hug. And we just sobbed. And, and this was a really rough-looking dude. I, he's the one I'd want beside me in a bar fight. And he's just, it, we're just sobbing together. Uh, he didn't offer any platitudes. In fact, I was avoiding community because I was getting far too many platitudes of quick fixes. Um, and part of it, I was just, I was proud. I, was, I felt ashamed. I didn't like I didn't like being the center of attention. I didn't know how I could be present without it being too much the center of attention. Um, we need those touches from God. We need to create space for people. And when we're hurting, it's okay. There's times when God wants us to be front and center uh, and receive that touch. But then we, he, he also, a healthy community does that in small doses. Um, to walk through it. So in, in community, um, there's some good hygiene practices that we can do. So one of them is we learn how to share. We learn how to share appropriately. If there's a group full of people, and I have, well, we're practicing this in our spiritual discovery, and I have two minutes or three minutes, we do sharing in what we call uh, green light, yellow light, red light. Green light is, hey, how do you think the Broncos are going to do today? I don't know. You know let's, let's talk about last week's game see how we're going to do today. That's green light. Okay, we just, we can leave that for, for some, some, other, some other, types, other type of community. When we want to go into spiritual community, we want a place with Christ at its center. So we bring our authentic self, but we don't bring... We don't go to those red places, the red lights, those places of brokenness and trauma that need to be unpacked over time, right? I don't, if I have three minutes and I I'm, I'm have a lot of fresh wounds right now, I'm not going to bring out, oh, uh, yeah, this, I, I, I need to be ministered to right now. There's not, we, we bring things that there, where there's time in three minutes where I can be authentic and people can authentically honor my story in that three minutes, if someone is rolling out trauma and it's like, oh, thank you, uh, let's open up that wound and now we're going to hear from the next person, right? It's, it doesn't honor us. It doesn't honor our story. We can't honor that person. We can't minister to them. 
That's something more for healing prayer in another setting. So in small groups, we learn. We learn to, to share out of that yellow space. We're kind of moving with caution. We're building trust. Can I trust this person with my story without jumping in and try to steal my pain? Without jumping in and try to fix it? Without jumping in and say, oh, you, but me. Uh, I'm going to use... So what happens? I sh- you, share, you share a wound and there's a, there's a real connection that takes place. And the empathy is when you share your story, right? If someone, we go to a funeral, for instance. We just went to a funeral. Someone's just, uh, they've gone, they're in a major loss. Well, that reconnects us to our loss, which might not be quite as fresh. And what ha- often happens is because we have this, I have this empathetic connection, you have a loss, I'm feeling my loss, you start telling me your story, and then maybe as that last word's coming out of your mouth, I jump in and start telling my story. What I'm trying to do is connect, but what the bad practice is, is I've hijacked your story to be about me. And so what we want to do is, yes, if someone's telling their story, feel your pain from your similar story, because the pain is very similar. And that's the empathetic connection. But then from that, remain silent and be present. Let them, let them feel their pain, and you feel, you feel your pain, and in that, there's this, oh, we both have, we know, both know the pain of loss, but right now, I'm going to make space for you to be about, to be about you, not about my story. I'm going I'm to, your story is holy, and I'm going to enter into this holy communion with you and God. That's when we receive the touch of God through one another. And if you have a small group and you want to move into that space, Kathy and I would love to help you create that, that sense of community and that space and the courage to do it. Because you don't, you don't know where it's going to go. But there's that sense of, of trusting in God. Um, and that sense of worship, of, of being touched by God and God touching someone else through you that that's what we want to move from community to spiritual community. That flows out into ministry. Um, let's, put the, let's put the picture of the second picture of Jesus and the, and the woman. The, the broad, the, it's the bee. Yeah, that one. So this is a painting, uh, painting by... Christ and the Sinful Woman by Vissily Polonov, 1888. But at the center, at the, on the left over here, we see Jesus with his disciples around him, right? This is, Jesus is always coming into his community with the fullness of his, of his um, communion with the Father. And he, so he's sitting with his disciples, and then the Pharisees are bringing in a woman they caught in adultery. Now, they don't even... They don't even care about her, right? What, what they care about is they, they, she has violated their sense of propriety. And, and they want to stone her and they want to use her as an object lesson to attack Jesus' teaching, uh, to attack Jesus' character. They are coming from the periphery of that outside, very outside circle of community, so think of community as also has successive concentric, concentric circles. And they just, they just wanna, they wanna pull Jesus out of his communion, out of his community, and, and into their whole dysfunctional mess. And Jesus invites her in. He invites them in. Let him who is without sin cast the first stone. He's inviting them to come closer to the communion of the Father. Ah. Uh, and they get a look at it, and they decide not to come too close. They, they get a look at that and said, yeah, I'm out of here. And they drop their stones and leave, and the woman's left alone. And he invites her into the presence of the healing community, right? They leave, and she's left with this healing community. And it is in that healing community where we receive those touches of God that healing happens for the world. And that... That com- your communion that you have with the Father, that is what all creation longs for. That is what every lost soul longs for, is that communion with the Father that you have. And that is being expressed in community. In community, our communion is being tested and purified. 
we're, we're learning where am I, where am I, where am I trying, where am I receiving from God? Where am I receiving from God through you? And where am I trying to get from you without touching God? And where am I trying to, to draw from you without actually going into the presence of God? Henry Nouwen says, community is that place, right? So Jesus, right, with the last person listed in his community in, that, in the very opening of that scripture is Judas Iscariot, who was a traitor. He says, now it's not, only, it's not always that strong. Sometimes it will be. Sometimes people will betray you. But there's always in community that discordant note. That person, ah, yeah, I'd rather wish they weren't there because they violate my sense of propriety, maybe my, my um, oh, what's the word? Uh, the, 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 my, my core values. They violate my core values. And, and, it, and I don't like the freedom they have in doing that, and it, it just upsets me, so I really wish they weren't there. Uh, they talk too much, they grab the tension away, and there's always that discordant note. But that is what is purifying and tested our communion with God. And community, there's something element in community that always drives us back to communion. And we get filled in communion, filled up like a reservoir, and now we're ready to be a safe and secure person in community. And for the broken people, we're ready for them to taste some of that. We share some of that security. We share some of that safety. We, 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 we help model for them how to share appropriately how to receive touches of God. And they see the gifts of the Spirit working through them, how to give those touches. And in that, we are built up. And that's the place where ministry happens among us, with Christ among us, and ministry happens to the outside world as we, as we bring them in from, from people who are hostile to the gospel to people who are curious, from people who are curious to people who are, they're drawn they touched, they tasted something, and they want more. And then from that, the Lord will bring certain people to come into your inner circle. Um, when we're forming those very closest friendships, those very most intimate places, it's not, like a blind, it's not like going on a blind date and you have to get engaged by the end of the date. You know. So when we, when we form small groups, for instance, we say, let's, let's do them for nine months. Just commit for nine months. And if, if, it's, if it's a healthy place, if it's working for you, maybe you want to do another nine months. But it's, it's not a life commitment. It's not, not a life commitment or, or a life sentence, depending on, on whether the, the small group is healthy or not. And I've, I've been some that have been very healthy and some that were rather dysfunctional. And the dysfunctional ones I usually was gone pretty quickly because um, they're, they're just not pleasant to be around. But at every level of community that the Lord has inviting you into approach that with um, a courage a courage to be the one who reaches out and avoid the temptation to receive from community what only God can give but also avoid the temptation to hoard your communion with God because it needs an outflow if we don't have an outflow for, for our communion it becomes like yesterday's manna God is giving you fresh manna every day and he's saying share it Share it. Share my presence. And when we don't, that sort of that flow is cut off and worms start to grow in our soul. Um, so do the fresh manna. So I invite you um, to the table this morning. And I and I invite you to come to the Lord from this place of communion to receive the Lord's invitation daily as part of Jesus' rhythm of communion, community, and ministry. Just take time each day to get in touch with that inner sanctuary, that inner garden, however the Lord meets with you, whether it's for a long time or a short time. But let it be authentic and let it be genuine. Let him feed your soul. Let him remind you, remind you once again of your belovedness. That in you I am well pleased. You are my son and daughter. And I'm recreating you into my image to be my temple, to be my child. That this is the communion. I want to give you the communion that the whole creation is longing for. 
I want to fill you with that. And then they receive the Lord's invitation into community. I don't know what that looks like. It might be a small group. It might not. It might be sacred space. It might be, it might be coming to join us for the downside up videos. It might be to invite someone to coffee. It might be the next time you're just having a handshake with somebody just to look them in the eyes and see them, to see their pain and just say, you're really hurting, aren't you? Without trying to fix it. Just sit with them in it, in that, and uh, share the Lord's presence together. So Lord, you made space for us at your table. You made space for us in your communion. Father, you so loved the world that you sent your only begotten Son to draw us into your fellowship. Jesus, you became one of us so that we could join you where you are in your fellowship with the Father to graft us into your body, to graft us into your worship, to graft us into your communion. And Jesus, your prayer that, Father, you, as you are in me, so I am in them. And Father, I pray that they would be one as you and I are one. This is one of the, one of the last prayers of Jesus in John 17, that we would become one. Not that we would all think the same, but we would become one heart in his communion with the Father through all our individual expressions of who who's creating you to uniquely be. That living stone built up into this glorious temple that the Lord fills with his radiance and is making all things new in creation, for which all creation groans, for which the lost of this world groan, for which the community here at the sanctuary groans, for which this inner temple within you groans, this outflowing communion with the Father, flowing out, filling up as a reservoir, overflowing its top into community, into ministry. So Jesus, on the night he was betrayed by Judas, whom he invited into his inner circle of community intentionally, on the night he was betrayed by his disciples, they all scattered, they all left him. And he knew this, and he still called them into his inner circle. On the night Jesus was betrayed by you and by me, for the joy set before him, for the joy of forgiveness and reconciliation and that union, that living temple, the new Jerusalem, that we would be one as he and the Father are one, as inconceivable as that sounds. On that night, Jesus took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. On that night, when he was betrayed by his closest friends, he took the cup. And he said, thank you, Father, for this cup. This cup that he asked the Father to, if it was possible to take it from him. Father, is it possible for them to be one as we are one without me drinking this cup of betrayal, of brokenness, of suffering, rejection? Lord, is it possible? And the, son, and the Father says, Son, this is, this is what we're doing, you and I, in the Spirit. We're entering into their brokenness, their betrayal, their very captivity to sin and death, their captivity to evil. We're going to enter into it and transform it from within. So 
take a piece of bread, dip it into the wine, or take one of the cups if you would prefer to have juice. It's the same blood. And eat of it. And remember, God is calling you to communion. God is crafting you into community. And he's crafting that community into his body, which is given for the world. So Father, we receive your grace. Your grace of your communion, the grace of your presence among us in community, and the grace of creating space for others to come and taste, to come and taste and be drawn in into deeper levels of community, into deeper levels of communion. And Father, we extend that invitation to ourselves. We receive that. We receive your grace, your love, that heals us where we cut and joins us together. Lord, that brings loving communion into those places where we've been betrayed. That brings the touch of your spirit to those places where words have cut us and creates in us new creation, a new heart, a courageous heart, a connected heart. Lord, draw us up into your communion in every aspect of our lives, in every aspect of our community, in every aspect of our worship and our ministry. Jesus, be Jesus in us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. For those with the spiritual um, discovery event retreat, um, we'll, we'll gather at, at 11.45 in about 15 minutes. Your lunches are downstairs. Um, the rest of you, please stay and gather in the, in the foyer and uh, enjoy one another's presence. See and be seen. Just give authentic light touches to one another. Lord's blessing upon you. Amen.